am Stephanie Barnett. I am a lead here from Ed Reports. Um, been working alongside this wonderful KDE team over the past several months, preparing you, preparing everything for the consumer guide. So we're really excited about the work that we've already completed and the work that's about to partake on our Kentucky students and educators. Alongside me, I also work with um, my wonderful colleague, Amanda Bukowski, and she has also been a huge part of this project. And we're just really grateful to be with you guys today. So today's objective is to prepare regional cooperative staff and EPPs on how to use the consumer guide for science. This will enable you to effectively support districts, pre-service teachers, and leaders throughout the state. We want you to become familiar with the consumer guide and its embedded tools and resources. So you and those that you work with can utilize high quality instructional resources. Today, we'll spend most of our time providing an overview of the content in the Consumer Guide and walk you through several tools that you can use and share with people that you support. By the end of today, you will have a customizable presentation deck, training materials that you can use in the field when working with the districts, the pre-service teachers and leaders that you work with. This will also help emphasize the importance of high quality instructional resources. The Consumer Guide is designed to serve as a valuable resource for districts across the state as they evaluate and select high quality instructional resources. The KDE, the Kentucky Department of Education, has dedicated significant time and effort to piloting and researching and developing of this guide. As a result, it is designed to be a highly useful tool that can be used consistently and consistently applied throughout the state. The development process for the Consumer Guide follows the same approach we use to create the reading and writing and math consumer guides over the past two years. KDE and Ed Reports have collaborated and created the Science Guide based upon the existing reading and writing and math consumer guides. As KDE develops guides across all content areas, they aim to maintain a consistent basic structure, format, and organization. The specific changes in each guide relate to the content-specific supports and tools. The next step in the development process was to bring the draft to our instructional resource reviewers. They provided feedback on the content-specific portions, which included the science markers, the equity lens look fors and the science-specific tools designed to support the guides used at the local level. The revised draft then went to our Quality Curriculum Task Force for their review and approval. This group was formed back in 2019 and is composed of teachers, school, and district leaders, as well as higher ed re representatives. The draft, the draft of the Consumer Guide was then provided to districts participating in our science pilot program to support the selection of a primary highly quality, high quality instructional resource for their district. We then collected the feedback on their experience while they were using the, the guide. Finally, KDE and Ed Reports collaborated to address any feedback that was received from the pilot. The final version of the guide was then released statewide in the spring of 2024. For our agenda today, we'll be together until around noonish. So we'll begin with a brief overview of why materials matter for students here in Kentucky. The KDE team will provide an overview of the consumer guide and to conduct an in-depth examination of some of the key embedded tools. We'll take a break around 10.30 and then we'll offer some tips and tricks for supporting districts, pre-service educators, and leaders using the Consumer Guide. Most important, you will gain access to a folder containing templates you can use to create trainings for your own districts. We'll conduct around, we conclude around noon with a wrap up and a quick discussion of next steps. To guide our learning today, I wanna to highlight a few norms outlined on this slide. First, please take care of yourself as a learner and attend to your needs. While we have a break midway through the session, feel free to step away or stretch as needed to practice your self-care. We'll engage in discussions both in breakout groups and as whole groups. Please honor every voice and experience and practice vulnerability and trust. 
we encourage you to be focused, engaged, contributor in both the whole group and the breakout group discussions. Please utilize the chat feature or unmute yourself to actively participate. And last, let's keep our students at the center of our conversations and work. We'll discuss the impact of instructional resources on students and educators, and we welcome your questions, your ideals, and your comments on the content that we cover. Today, we'll use a couple of tools in our training session. In Zoom, we will utilize breakout rooms and the chat feature throughout the day. Feel free to drop questions in the chat box or unmute yourselves when needed. We'll provide a link to the participant folder in the chat. This folder contains all the resources that we'll be using today, including the newly published consumer guide from the KDE website and your participant handout. Please make a copy and feel free to take notes as needed. You'll also find a presentation deck in the participant voter that you can use as a resource for the presentation uh, for all the information that we present today. Finally, your colleagues are here to help. If you have any questions or you encounter any technical issues, please let us know in the chat. We are here to help you, especially in your breakout rooms. You can use the ask for help feature and we'll come in to help to assist. Before we get into the content, just a quick note on some words. EdReport uses the term high quality instructional materials across our website to describe the programs, the textbooks, and the resources we review. The Kentucky Department of Education uses the term instructional resources, which is defined in Kentucky law as the print, non-print, or electric medium designed to assist student learning. Throughout this presentation, we'll primarily use the term instructional resources. You may notice that the term instructional materials is used on the following aid report specific slides. For the purpose of this presentation, please consider instructional resources and instructional materials as interchangeable. Aid reports is an independent nonprofit organization committed to improving K-12 education. Our mission is to empower teachers, administrators, and leaders by increasing their ability to seek identify and demand the highest quality instructional materials for students. By leveraging the expertise of our educators who support the instructional materials and supporting effective adoption processes, we strive to equip teachers across the nation with excellent resources. We take pride in conducting the work we do with practicing educators in the field. Ed Reports is for educators by educators organization. Our curriculum review teams consist of five educators with content area expertise representing a variety of roles, states, and grade levels. This diversity ensures that multiple perspectives thoroughly examine all aspects of the core curriculum. Our reviews are led by teachers from across the country who meet weekly to collect evidence and create reports. Reviewers spend approximately 150 hours during a review cycle to collect, synthesize, and write the reports. Every member of a review team evaluates every single page of the instructional materials that we review. To fulfill our mission, Ed Reports evaluates comprehensive year-long curriculum materials to assess their alignment with high-quality instructional expectations. We share tools and rubrics that states, districts, and schools can use to evaluate materials before adoption, and we provide those resources to support the selection and implementation of instructional materials. Additionally, we assist states and districts with capacity building efforts to help them identify and select high quality instructional materials. Ed Reports offers a variety of resources to help educators identify high quality instructional materials. However, the organization does not recommend, recommend materials for adoption, assess materials for efficacy, endorse any specific pedagogical beliefs or approaches, or create any instructional materials. Additionally, it's important to note and to emphasize that we do not accept any payment from publishers for reviews. This independence allows us to focus on the services we provide and produce unbiased reports for consumers to use. 
Awesome. Good morning. So with that, we're going to move into our first session of the morning, which is really getting into why instructional resources really matter for Kentucky students. And so for the next few slides, you're going to see some interesting data and statistics on teaching time spent creating resources, the impact of high quality instructional resources, and the current use of high quality instructional resources across contents and specifically in science. We'll provide you a moment at the beginning of each slide to kind of review the data and feel free to go ahead and take notes as you're looking through in your note catcher, um, thinking about some of your reflective reflections to this data. And so with that, we'd like to ask to, for you to set your own uh, lenses for learning of what you're listening for and what you're thinking about as we go through this data. So as you're listening, if you could just reflect on and again, feel free to jot in your note catcher, you know, what about this data really resonates with you when you think about why instructional resources matter? Is there any data that's especially surprising to you? And what connections do you see to your own work and to the needs of Kentucky students and Kentucky educators? Teachers and instructional resources are really central to student learning. And why are resources so critical? We know that there are many factors that influence what happens in the classroom, but at the heart of it, it's the experience that comes down to the teacher, the student, and the content that they're interacting with for learning. The resources then that teachers are using really directly affects how and what they teach. Teachers spend an average of seven to 12 hours per week searching for or creating instructional resources, some of which we know they're paying for out of their own pocket. A 2017 RAND analysis found that 96% of teachers are using Google and 75% of teachers are using Pinterest to find lessons and materials, many of which are just unvetted. What this leads to is inconsistent quality, and what we see is that it impacts low-income students and students of color the most, creating even greater inequity issues. We know that teachers want materials that are aligned with their state standards, that engage and challenge their students, and they include content and approaches that are culturally relevant. What we also know is that few teachers believe that their materials are really meeting these needs. And this can lead to them seeking and using this unvetted materials. In a 2023 study, 77% of teachers said that they create their own classroom materials to supplement or replace a textbook. And 78% of teachers said that they found supplemental resources online when they were searching for non-textbook resources. When looking at online supplemental resources, this pie chart here illustrates that those resources are often weakly aligned and often limited, offer limited supports to students. In this 2019 study, you can see that the most resources vary in the sense of not aligned, weakly aligned, or mostly aligned. What this led to and what the TNTP's opportunity myth shows us is that students are spending approximately 70% of instructional minutes on assignments that are not aligned to grade level expectations. But the good news is what TNTP also found is that when students who started the year off behind grade level were given more grade appropriate assignments, stronger instruction, deeper engagement, and higher expectations, the gap between these students and their higher achieving peers began to narrow substantially. Now we'll look at what can happen when high quality instructional materials are present. When teachers have access to and effectively imp implement high quality instructional resources, research shows that it results in improvements in teacher practice and gains in student achievement. We're going to take a look at two studies now, and I'll give you a chance to process those individually. For the first, you likely notice the effect on learning of improved teacher performance. And then for the second, how deeper learning is supported by engaging students in the practices of that content area. And while the second study looked at math specifically, its findings would likely hold true for other content areas as well because of the intentional research-based design of high-quality instructional resources and their emphasis on students really engaging in those disciplinary practices. We've also heard about the impact of high quality instructional resources on teachers and students from those districts participating in our Kentucky pilots. 
Some common belief benefits that they've shared with us in terms of impact on teachers include, and we'll post them here for you to, to read and process, freeing up their time to leverage what is engaging in the resource and to meet individual student needs, and raising their expectations of what students are able to know, understand, and do, regardless of their ability and background. And then in terms of the impacts that they're seeing on students, they pointed to these things. For that first bullet, literacy folks may have connected this to background knowledge supporting comprehension, as here also supports access to grade level learning more generally. Parents have even shared with teachers and leaders how students are coming home and talking about what they're reading and what they're learning because they're engaged in the content. Now thinking about high quality instructional resources for science, we know they play a crucial role in fostering curiosity and wonder in students. When students engage with relevant and captivating science topics, they naturally shift their focus from memorizing a bunch of facts to really exploring how and why things happen. Our goal as educators is to guide students through discovery, allowing them to reach solutions on their own rather than just being handed the answers. This approach we know cultivates critical thinking and problem solving skills, which we know are essential to scientific inquiry. And we know that it's a delicate balance. We need to provide enough structure and support to keep students on track, while also giving them the freedom to explore and experiment. By doing so, we're encouraging a deeper, more meaningful understanding of science. And now Stephanie's gonna share with us the current state of science instructional resources. As we look ahead to the future of science education, it's important to acknowledge the limited number of high quality science resources. According to the state of the market survey, 96% of science educators agree that having science instruction materials aligned to their state standards is crucial. However, only 37% believe their current materials meet this need. When we examine what is being used in our current classrooms, we find that aligned core curricular science materials are noticeably lacking. EdReports has reviewed 80% of the resources that have been used in grades six, eight classrooms and found that four programs currently meet expectations. In K-5 classrooms, 46% of core curriculum materials have been reviewed and two currently meet expectations. Despite these challenges, there is promising news. Several publishers are continuing to work to improve their existing materials based upon our reviews, or they're creating new resources daily. Many have engaged with Ed Reports for future reviews, and the future does look promising. By addressing the gaps in the alignment and usability, science teachers may soon have access to a selection of high-quality, standards-aligned science resources very similar to our reading, writing, and mathematic programs. As the market continues to evolve to meet all those quality benchmarks, we can anticipate positive impacts in the science classrooms across Kentucky, very similar, like I've said, to those that we've seen in the math, reading, and writing. The current lack of aligned materials affect what is taught in the classrooms. Only 30% of teachers report using any core program as their comprehensive set of instructional materials. This results in classroom environments that are very different. So these results environments are the majority of resources that are supplemental. In fact, 50% of science educators rely on supplements as their comprehensive sets of instructional materials. This heavy reliance on the supplements can significantly impact coherence as it is very challenging to create a cohesive learning experience for all students when combining lessons from multiple resources or from a work year's worth of different resources. Great, so now that you've had a chance to review that data, let's revisit those reflection questions. 
We'd love to invite you now in the chat to share a response to any one of these questions that's really sticking with you. And again, those questions are, what's really resonating with you about why resources matter for our students? Any data that really surprised or stood out to you? And connections that you see to your own work and the needs of Kentucky educators and students? And again, we'd love to invite you to the chat to drop in just your response to one of those questions. I think you all seeing some great reflections in the chat. I'm seeing a lot of surprising in terms of like the alignment of what's out there for science. I think that's really helpful when we think about like the long-term impact of standards adoption and what happens to the market over time. If you think about what Stephanie shared, we kind of saw that time that it took for ELA and math materials to start to become more aligned and meet those indicators of quality with once Common Core came out. And we expect to kind of see the same thing with science that as we continue to report on resources and more and more publishers begin to see what it looks like to be aligned to those those uh, standards, that we're going to see more and more of that in the science market as well. Thank you. I see a lot of connections that teachers are noticing that their resources don't feel like they're meeting those needs. I think that's a really important thing to call out. I think we saw something in chat earlier about how do high quality instructional resources for science connect to high quality instructional resources in other areas. And a lot of those are those needs that teachers identified that should be true of all materials, which I think we'll look at a little bit as you're looking in the consumer guide today. And yes, glad to see that more and more resources that are high quality are becoming available. I think as we're as we're looking through today and thinking about the questions that you set, it'll be really helpful to see what you learn in terms of what to help your teachers look for, what to help your districts look for, and how to really identify where those indicators of quality are. Thank you all so much. And please feel free to continue posting in the chat as things come to mind. Um, but what we do want to do now is we're going to transition into our next section where we're going to focus on providing you an overview of the new science consumer guide. And so particularly in this se or section, what we want to focus on is providing you some background context on the purpose of KDE's consumer guides. Look at the overall structure of the new science consumer guide. <clears throat> We want to spend some time digging into the KDE characteristics of high quality science instructional resources. So those that we've identified as the criteria of which you would want to evaluate against, as well as just time to explore a couple of the key tools in the science consumer guide to support districts in the selection process. And let me just add that today is really just about giving you a very high level overview, just an awareness of some things within the consumer guide. And we really encourage you that after the session today to, as you have time to, to dig more deeply into everything that is there. But we do want to start with just some background context around this work. So in March of 2020, the KDE released the curriculum development process just to provide districts with a systematic approach that they could use to develop and implement a local curriculum that's supported by a primary HQIR. And on this slide, you can see the most recent version of the CDP, and it consists of four phases. So I want to pause, just give you a moment to look at the outline of the phases, um, just to gain an initial sense of the process and the work that it involves. And so 
The first step in phase three, this is where the district identifies, evaluates, and selects a primary high quality instructional resource that's aligned to their instructional vision that they developed back in phase two. And then that resource is used in the development of their local curriculum. But while the CDP provides general guidance, we knew that there needed to be more support specifically right here in phase three, step one, in helping districts select resources that are aligned to the Kentucky academic standards for that content area. KRS 156405 also establishes the need for the KDE to provide a consumer guide to support districts in the evaluation and selection process. So just based on all of that, the KDE set out three years ago to start creating consumer guides for each content area with the focus on the science consumer guide this past year. Now, this slide shows the layout in the organization of the Science Consumer Guide. And as Stephanie mentioned earlier, it's going to be the same as the Reading and Writing and Math Consumer Guides because we want to maintain consistency across these documents. So it's going to open with an introduction that's just going to provide some background context. It'll connect to the curriculum development process, and it will spotlight a little bit of that rationale around the use of HQIRs. The second section, which is where we're going to dig in here in just a minute, it focuses on the specific characteristics of high quality science instructional resources. And that section is going to open with framing around KDE's general definition of HQIRs. And that definition, it includes six characteristics. So you can see those here on the slide. I'm going to pause and just give you a moment, read through the six characteristics of HQIRs in general. And as you can see, first and foremost, or foremost, for something to be considered a high quality instructional um, uh, resource, it must be aligned to the Kentucky academic standards for the content area. And to help understand what that looks like in science, the next subsection is going to highlight the specific markers that should be considered when identifying and evaluating resources to ensure alignment to the Kentucky academic standards for science. Now, the markers that you're going to look at here in just a minute, they were drafted through a back and forth collaboration between KDE science consultants and ed reports, and they're based on the Kentucky academic standards for science, as well as the instructional resource alignment rubric that's linked a little bit later later in the consumer guide. And so within this section, you're going to see the four markers that we ultimately landed on. And those include three-dimensional science, investigating phenomena, defining and solving engineering problems, and then access to standards for all learners. For each marker, the consumer guide is going to include some explanatory text as well as some bulleted considerations. And so what we want to do is provide you an opportunity just to individually read through the science markers. So there should be a link coming in the chat for you to access the consumer guide. And I want to pause, just give you a moment to get that opened up in its own tab on your computer. Um, and you're going to want to scroll down to page five in the document. And then also go ahead and grab your participant handout. And if you didn't have an opportunity to print that out, just make sure you do have some paper in front of you where you can capture some thinking. So I'll pause and give you a moment again, open up the document and grab your participant handout. As you read, we want you to think about what information seems most important in helping districts to evaluate resources for evidence using each marker. The marker section is going to begin near the top of page five, and it's going to go through the top of page eight. And again, there's space at the bottom of page one of your participant handout to capture your thinking as you read. We're going to give you about four to five minutes to kind of skim through those. Again, just making note of what seems really important here in helping districts to evaluate resources for evidence evidence using each marker. What questions can we answer or is anyone having any issues accessing the document? Okay, then we'll pause right now and give you some individual reading time.
And then let's come back together. And it's okay if you did not get all the way through. But what we want to do now is just to help you process what you read, we're going to send you into breakout rooms to have a discussion focused on the information that you noted that seems most important in helping districts to evaluate resources using these markers. Um, and also, while you're in your breakout rooms, please feel free to capture important information that emerges from that conversation in the same space on page one of your participant handout. Um, but again, breakout rooms are going to open again make sure everyone has an opportunity to participate in the conversation and we will see you all back here in about five minutes welcome back i still see people making their way back in so hopefully you had some good conversation and now we do just want to create some space for you to share out some of the things you discussed in your breakout room so what were some of the things that you all talked about that seemed really important that could help districts when they're evaluating resources using these markers please feel free to unmute and share or you can post your thinking in the uh, chat so just thoughts around those markers and useful information And again, feel free to, you can post in the chat or you can unmute and share. But we would love to hear some of your thinking around that. I'll share. One of the things that we discussed were, especially for our pre-service teachers at the universities, um, when they're going in and observing and doing their clinicals, they really don't have much reflection on science, especially three-dimensional science. Um, more so in the primary, and then you get to your fourth grade science teachers that are saying that they feel like they have zero science background because it's not being taught with fidelity from kindergarten to third grade. And it's they're focusing more on the reading and the math. So by the time they get to that tested area, they really are struggling to get their students on grade level and being able to teach them at that three dimensional level. So just basically being able to prepare even our pre-service teachers with how we create those three-dimensional learning assessments and maybe even using backward design so that they can see this is what it should look like at the end and this is how we build our lessons from that. Carla, thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, I think that's been, and I would also defer to Ed Reports a little bit on this, but I think that's been one of the reasons it's been slower in the market to get high quality science resources that are green rated because everyone's trying to figure out three-dimensional teaching, instruction, and assessment. And so we're starting to see now more and more resources coming on the market that are doing that really well. So teachers can then focus on implementing that, not just trying to design something that, I mean, I don't, you know, we're all still developing an understanding of. And I don't know, again, Ed reports, if you would add anything to that. Other thoughts as well. So there was discussion about um, connecting PBL and opportunities for students to show what they know. Um, also, the investigating phenomena spiraling throughout the entire learning experience rather than maybe being something that's just sort of used as a hook at the beginning mm -hmm. and then have a token connection at the end. Yes. Yeah. And, and and that's, you know, in our science pilot, one of the things Ed Reports did a great job of lifting up some examples from HQIRs of how an actual anchoring phenomena does drive an entire unit of instruction. It's not just some little <laughs> thing at the beginning that you never come back to. And there are HQRs in science that are explicitly looking at deeper learning and PBL models to inform that sort of engagement oh, in their curricula. <clears throat> Any other thoughts before we move on? So I have, there are students wanting to do more hands-on, but their supervising teachers are doing Google Classroom activities instead of hands-on. And, and that connects to a comment earlier about sort of with the omnipresence of Chromebooks um, that could be maybe being a barrier to doing more hands-on mm -hmm. concrete things. Yeah. Yeah, because while there is some benefit to digital platforms in some cases, really having students having those hands-on, and I would add to that, like minds-on experiences um, that really connect back to three-dimensional learning. With the Chromebooks, though, we've seen we've seen in some of the HQIRs really powerful, engageable simulations that technology can make available. So depending on how you're using it, there's promise there as well, but you can't totally replace 
students being able to get their hands on things and, and manually sort of engage them in the real world. Anything else before we move on? I just I'm I'm not sure who my group member is, but uh, he brought up a very good point that kind of answered one of my chat messages about when you go to websites and they promote that they are evidence based and they meet standards and they have people shown as validating. Uh, you have to really be able to vet yes. the website and see that it matches your state standards. And mm -hmm. I've been trying to kind of help some new teachers that don't have as many resources. And uh, so I'm excited to see what you guys are going to offer today. And Sherry, thank you so much. And that's why, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but because of the state of the market in science, we know districts may be looking at some things that haven't even been vetted yet by Ed Reports. And that's why that instructional resource alignment rubric is so important in really ensuring that it is aligned to our Kentucky academic standards and the markers that you all just looked at. But I will say that our markers very much line up with Ed Reports markers. So what they are uh, vetting resources against, um, the ones that you are going to see on their website, they are using basically the, that same criteria. So in moving on for time's sake, going back to that general definition of HQIR. So we know that they help us to ensure alignment to the Kentucky Academic Standards, which is that first part of KDE's general definition. But now let's jump down to the last two bullets. So in order again for something to be considered high quality, it needs to be culturally relevant, free from bias, and accessible for all students. And these two are addressed in the next subsection of the Consumer Guide. So to support schools and districts in selecting equitable resources, the Consumer Guide includes a detailed table that contains five equity lenses. We partnered with leading educators a few years ago to establish those five equity lenses, and then we worked with Ed Reports this past year to craft the specific look force in science resources aligned back to each of those lenses. And so we're not going to have time today to dig into this particular resource, but we definitely want to make sure we brought it to your attention. And we just we have a screenshot here because we want to kind of orient you to the layout of it. So when you are able to come back to it later, you'll know kind of what you're looking at here. So in that left hand column, that's where you're going to see the five equity lenses listed out. And again, these are consistent across all content areas. The second column will give you a general description of what we mean by that equity lens. Again, the same across content areas. The third column, this is where you're going to see what the, the specific look for's are in science in terms of aligning back to each one of those lenses. Um, so just know this document is linked in the consumer guide right as it's speaking about the equity lenses in that uh, subsection around characteristics of high quality science instructional resources. Okay, so coming back again to the table of contents, the final section of the guide takes districts through the process of identifying, evaluating, and selecting HQIRs for science. And again, this would mirror what you would find in the, in the CDP, the curriculum development process more generally. So for each step of the process, the consumer guide indicates a, uh, includes a brief description of the purpose of this step, and then it offers key questions that districts would consider as they work through that step and then key tools to sort of meet them there and support the work. So before we get into tools to support um, the HQR adoption process, as I'm sure you're aware, Senate Bill 1 from, from 2022 was passed into law and it, it like a big impact of that was shifting responsibility for developing the curriculum and selecting instructional resources from the site-based decision-making council to the local superintendent. Um, so when you look at the language of the law, this work is, is to be done, and this is important, in consultation with each school's S SBDM and the local board of education. Um, and it also calls for a reasonable review and response period for stakeholders throughout the process. So that stakeholder engagement piece has to be there. So in order to support districts in really adhering to Senate Bill 1, considerations for stakeholder inclusion and communication, you'll find them embedded throughout the consumer guide with guiding questions for each step where inclusion and communication show up most critically. Okay, so getting in now to the four parts of the HQR selection process, we'll use this graphic to help us visually map our movement through them. 
So this process begins with determining selection criteria based on a district's instructional vision and the markers of high quality science resources from section two of the consumer guide. So let's take a moment here um, and really start to consider what feeds into determining the selection criteria a district curriculum team will use to identify and then to evaluate resources. So when determining selection criteria, um, a district curriculum team is gonna draw upon their instructional vision, characteristics from the consumer guide, as we said a moment ago, specifically those markers and equity lenses, and then really be mindful of that stakeholder input. And all of this is distilled into what are hopefully a manageable set of criteria the curriculum team can then develop into a tool. Um, this tool often takes the form of an organ organizer, um, and then they use that for evaluating the resources, but maybe even most importantly, as a place to hold some of that evaluative thinking as they go through the decision-making process. So taking up then the element of stakeholder input, the purpose of the sample stakeholder questions for science, which was adapted from instruction partners and work with leading educators, is to help guide that input gathering from three core stakeholder groups. So first from teachers, then from families and student, or in communities, and then from students. So this guidance, and you'll find it linked as a key tool in the consumer guide, is critically important since it's really that stakeholder input um, that makes selection criteria and then the selected resource that eventually follows live like curricular pieces that everyone feels a sense of ownership of and can then commit to. So it may be helpful to know there are aspects of the stakeholder questions that are, that are general in nature and, and they'll be common across content areas and, and, the, and the guides as they're developed. Um, and then there are aspects specific to each content area. So of course, we're thinking about science this morning. So we'll pause now and give you some time, about three minutes to individually explore this tool. Um, as you explore it, uh, envision what use of this tool might actually look like in a district, and then which aspects of this resource stand out as potentially most helpful or most insightful. Um, so just remember there's space on page two of your participant handout to capture your thinking. Um, and I see the link is now in the chat. So we'll come back together after about three minutes of, of exploration time. So coming back, um, Coming back together now and, and heading toward um, heading toward the oh excuse me um, so we're gonna post one idea in the chat that you noted as to what use of this tool might look like in a district or which aspects of this resource stand out as most helpful and or insightful so just one idea that you might have made note of in the chat about what this would look like in a district or which aspects of the resource stand out as potentially most helpful or insightful. So jot a quick something in the chat. <clears throat> so we have an immediate um, liking of supporting students with varying, varying levels of, of emergent language. A call back to a group discussion of having literacy across the content areas, yeah, and, and the literacy gains that that can afford. Anything else about this? Okay, so um, appreciation for just the, this resource helping you really get at ways to best address different stakeholder groups. Yes, attention to the language of science being distinct from language in general. So, in fact, yeah. just making a connection to what someone had shared out a little bit ago, like why it's so important to get that student input is thinking about like if they don't want that digital experience so much, if they're looking for something else, that, like that's important information to have in really thinking about how are we best servicing and providing our students the kind of experience they are saying that they want. And being able to tie what you're, you're asking those sorts of questions of your stakeholder groups to really get clear on what they want so that you can then press your vendor potentially, which is where we'll go in a moment on some of those same things. Involvement of families in this process, absolutely um, critical is, is really having 
an informed and invested um, family network supporting their learners. And the content vocabulary, yes, and language. Sample questions that, that connect the work back to instructional values and vision, thank you. Okay, and, and a last one, but an important one. Um, key, questions that keep the conversation really focus on those key instructional shifts from the CAS for Science required in the classroom to help, again, secure that those shifts are made and showing up for our kids. All right, thank you. And again, as Missy said, the chat's open if, if further ideas come. But coming back to uh, our graphic for the local selection process now, once selection criteria have been finalized, the next step is to identify and evaluate potential HQIRs that meet those criteria. So after the markers help us to ensure alignment to the Kentucky academic standards, which again is that first component of KDE's general definition of HQIRs, the second and third components tell us uh, they need to be research-based and or externally validated and comprehensive. So for science resources, EdReports is a primary means of external validation that also addresses the various dimensions. So it'll look at the books, multimedia, tasks, assessments, digital interfaces, et cetera, of a resource that together would make it comprehensive. The KDE's Instructional Resources Alignment Rubric for Science, which you can find on kystandards.org, can also certainly help. And while that helps in, in any content area you look at, we'll see how it may have a, an especially important place in science when we're really thinking about informing resource evaluation. <clears throat> but we mentioned Ed Reports a moment ago. If you have been on Ed Reports and looked at green rated resources available for science, you probably quickly recognize that this market, unlike what we find for ELA and math, is still pretty early and there are not currently uh, many options available. So while this work is underway and there are resources constantly being added to the Ed Reports queue for review and then also finishing that process, we've added a temporary addendum to the consumer guide and one that we're thinking might be linked there for the next two years or so as, as the market for science matures. So we're gonna briefly highlight it now. Um, and it is our new considerations for adopting science HQIRs in the current market document, kind of a long title. Um, and while this resource offers a strategic range of considerations that districts might work through to meet their current instructional needs for science, we would really like to underscore that if a green rated resource is found that meets local needs, a district would not need to work through this guidance. They can just sort of with green, you know, proceed forward if, if, if something green rated is already set to meet their local needs. Um, so while we're not going to explore this resource today, if you are supporting a district who finds itself working through the considerations document, it can support a range of potential pathways that districts might effectively pursue toward adopting and implementing a science HQIR. So as we gathered feedback moving forward to our next tool from the districts in our reading and writing pilot, we recognized there was a need to create a resource to help guide conversations with vendor to, to really support that the narrowing of options and that final selection of a primary HQIR. So the sample HQIR vendor questions for science, and it's also linked as a key tool in the consumer guide, has evolved from an original draft created in partnership with Achievement Network uh, with ANET for the reading and writing pilot and now includes a wider range of potential questions a district might ask of science HQIR vendors to make sure that they're selecting the best resource according to their unique instructional visions and are set to get the, the vendor support needed for effective implementation. So again, the purpose of this tool, it, it's really designed to offer like what, what could be productive categories for inquiry and really pushing into those conversations. Um, suggestions of where lever leverage might lie in vendor conversations, and then also just help with crafting wording to really hone in on getting needs addressed. So we're going to have about four minutes here to explore that tool, the sample HQR vendor questions for science. And as you do, your, your lens for exploration will be considering the prompt, what might be a productive question or questions you could ask that you may not have thought to ask or a productive question or questions that you didn't even know you could ask of a vendor. So feel free to hold your thinking on page two of the participant handout. And I see the link is now in the chat. So we'll take 
just a couple minutes here, about four minutes to look through that tool um, with those two lenses. What, what's a question that could be especially productive to ask of a vendor? And maybe what's a question you didn't even, you might, it might not have even occurred to you to ask or that you could ask of a vendor. So we'll come back in about four minutes. <clears throat> Coming together now, and we're we're coming we're coming up close to a break. But just for some processing together before we get there, for both groups. So for those of you who are new to supporting work with the consumer guide, and then for for those of you who've had some experience with this, whether it was with the reading, writing, or math consumer guide, what were some of those additional supports that either you found yourself needing or that you might need moving forward? In our group, we just talked about how science is not visible. We're not seeing science taught in a lot of schools, especially with primary grades. And so it's great that we have these resources and we have this lens to view resources, but if it's not being part of the curriculum that we are accountable to teach, then it's not going to be a resource that's going to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And so we would, you know, and the fact that there's so many technology tools that you all had mentioned earlier, that's used more so than just them being hands-on and seeing those resources. So it sounds like resources to really address some of the barriers maybe that have kept science from being taught with sort of regularity. We know it needs to be. In our group, we talked about uh, about the resource, the science resource is awesome. And but it would be beneficial to have some sort of differentiation uh, embedded with the resources of, of suggested accommodations and modifications to meet the diverse needs of the students because uh, as we all know, when one size doesn't fit all and our students, as you know, and not only in the special ed classes, but in the general ed classes, there's such a variety of needs for our students that the differentiation and accommodations um, for specific standards would be extremely useful. Absolutely. I'm really grateful you pointed that out. And you may have noticed in the vendor questions, uh, the recommendation to ask about. Um, so there, there should be differentiated supports within sort of the tier one focus of the resource. But again, to what extent um, those are present and how effective they are could vary a little bit. So worth asking about. But then also, to what extent is the resource ready to support um, some tier two intervention as well? Or, you know, a really you will find some of that, how much you find varies. And it's really important to ask about to get that right resource. And I think we would add to that, you know, that's why local context is so critically important in this work. Like HQIRs, any green rated resource is going to bring something great to the table, but they may not all necessarily meet your local context and your needs. And that's why you do have to kind of carefully evaluate those that you have narrowed down to, to see, do they really fit our local context, our student population? And if not, what are those things we're going to need to do to kind of help supplement that? Uh -huh. So in the chat, um, thinking about pre-service and teacher preparation, <clears throat> that that the rubrics could really help um, folks be better better informed consumers of science resources mm -hmm. um, when you're in situations where there there has not been a coherent um, comprehensive curriculum adopted or you know yet put in play. Um, we're going to start by now looking into Edderports and seeing how you can utilize Edderports as a resource in this work. I'm first going to take you through the Edderports website and just highlight a couple of key features that you will find super beneficial, not just for your own information and learning, but we hope is you can also use this to share with your districts, pre-service teachers, and leaders. Edderports.org is our website, and you're welcome to type into your browsers and follow along in, in another window if that helps you, um, but you will also have some time in just a few minutes to explore on your own. On our website, you'll be able to explore reports, access various review tools that we use for our reports, and also look at our evidence guides and additional resources that we provide, including things like case studies, including other tools that are used across uh, the country, and so all of those things you can access when you explore our website. 
As you all know, Ed Reports is known for its vetted reports published by our educators nationwide. You can access reports for ELA, math, and science by clicking on Explore Reports, which is highlighted in yellow at the top of the screen. This is also where you can access the list of upcoming reviews. So those are for programs that are either currently being reviewed or going to be reviewed soon in the future. And you can always check back to see if a program that you're maybe a district is considering is on that list. To access the reports from our, our, our uh, to access our reports from our report center, you can visit our website again at edreports.org. Once you have clicked on that explore reports, then you can navigate to the science section. Click on that, and then you'll be able to read our science reports of all of those programs that have been reviewed and those reports that have been republished. When you select on science, you'll be directed to the Science Report Center specifically. Within that report center, you'll discover which science programs have been have received a green reading from Ed Reports, as well as those that haven't met the criteria for standard alignment and those usability criteria. Those reports are listed in order of timeliness, so they begin with the most recently released reports, and then you can scroll down to browse all the different science reports that we have. You can also utilize the search bar and some of those filters to look at things like alignment, specific grade level spans, and things like that. You'll see a snapshot of each report on the screen, and then you can click to dig a little bit deeper to, re to read that full report or to look at grade level alignment across the different grade levels that that program uh, provides. In addition to looking at overall alignment, each report includes a gateway summary for each gateway, a criterion level summary for each rating sheet, and a detailed report for each indicator. This indicator level report will provide specific examples of how the material meets, partially meets, or did not meet the expectations of that indicator. And this is really where we encourage you to go to find information to support curricular decisions within your context so you can look at those local priorities and how those materials do or do not meet those priorities. Along with those awesome reports that we publish, we also have some tools that we offer. So now let's take some time to look at the tools to understand the review process in more detail. To access our tools on our website, first locate our process page at the top of the page next to Explore Reports. Clicking the drop-down menu will present you with two options, the Review Tools and Become a Reviewer. Please choose Review Tools. From there, you can select the grade band tool and content you want, such as Science K-5. This will then provide you with the option to either choose the evidence guides or the review criteria. We'll start with the evidence guides, which are essential when we evaluate materials. These guides include information on our gateway system, the criteria, and the indicators that are used as well as the purpose, the research, the connections that support each indicator. They also cover the scoring system and how points are allocated. Review teams undergo extensive training on how to effectively and thoroughly use these evidence guides throughout a review. Each indicator in the guides is thoughtfully crafted and created to ensure that it reflects the highest quality in a set of science materials. The review criteria are actual documents that we use during the review. These documents outline how gateways, criteria, and indicators are, are scored. Using this information, review teams can easily determine whether the set of materials meets, partially meets, or does not meet expectations that are established by the indicators. Think of the review criteria as a condensed version of those evidence guides that concentrate specifically on the scoring aspect. Now let's take three to four minutes for you to go and visit EdReport's website, edreports.org on your own, and to navigate around to figure out and see all the amazing reports, all the tools, everything that we offer on the website. Make note of any questions or clarifications you might have while you're exploring and while we're all here together.
As you explore the website, consider how the tools and the resources could truly benefit the work you do with your districts, the pre-service teachers and leaders utilizing all of those resources. Take a few minutes and browse, browse individually and we'll reconvene as a whole group to discuss any observations or questions you may have. The link is in the chat. All right, thank you guys for taking time to explore. Um, I did want to address the question in the chat from Amanda really quick about social studies. Good news about social studies. As we all know, social studies is quite large and it expands from state to state. Each state is very different. There's work behind the scenes that we have not published yet, but that is coming. Um, we are also in the field right now uh, with pre-K. So pre-K reports are being um, undergone Currently, those will be released sometime in the summer, along with social studies in the near future. So we, we're excited about the work that is partaking in social studies world. Um, so thank you for those wonderful questions and your thoughtful um, explorations. 
I would like to now invite anyone who would like to share any observations, any other observations or questions to unmute or speak up or drop in the chat. In particular, I'd love to hear how you think these tools might support districts, pre-service teachers, and leaders in selecting high quality instructional resources for science. I have a little question. Uh, when I'm looking at it, and I love ed reports, I do, but is there a way to tell like on the reports if a resource is free? I don't know that I have figured that out. Is that an, a, because so many districts are struggling with resources now with the funds of ESSER being spent? And so just kind of wondering, is there a way to tell in ed reports if it's free? Great question, Mary. Um, we do not have that listed. However, we're very open. So like if you are curious about resources that are free for a specific content, we're going to give you all our contact information. You can feel free to email us and we will gladly reach out to those content areas to, to determine if they're OERs or if they're not. So we are more than welcome to answer those questions. Okay, thank you so much. You're very welcome. And we'll actually bring that question to our um, our tool creation, our individuals that run our website to see if we can start putting that information on our website. That I, I love getting those suggestions. Some shout out to the gateway system, the gateway rubrics. I, I agree, those are very helpful. I'm a math minded person, but really digging into the science gateways, the phenomenon, um, all of those wonderful things, the coherence, it really helps with the coherence in science. Great point, Fox, about the professional learning, of course. And some of those hard copy materials. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Um, and then there's a question about ML and special education. You're going to find those in our gateway three. So anything around ML, special education, anything for student supports, teacher supports, we provide a very detailed um, information in those. Specifically, our student supports is in criteria three. So if you really want to dig into the MLs and the student supports, gateway three, criteria three is where you want to dig into indicators and points. So great question. So anyone can go to our website and request us to like review um, a set of materials. It does not have to be the publisher, but if there is a, a, a set of materials that needs to be reviewed, that's comprehensive, full course, year long, you can go on there and suggest we reach out to the publishers and we actually buy the materials. So like we purchase it from them and then we begin our review. But we're always looking for materials because there's so many that's on the market that we um, that get developed every year that we don't know about until um, educators say, hey, have you seen this set of materials? Can you take a look at this? And then our science team or whichever team is like looking at that set of material will go and do a investigation to make sure it's comprehensive and full full year. Yes, there is a page on our website where you can see upcoming reviews. Um, I believe it is on when you do explore reports, you can drop down where you see all the contents, where you can see math, reading, science, and then it says upcoming reviews. It will show you the upcoming reviews. I will also say that currently we are paused on any new reviews for any content because our tools are going through a revision. We are speeding up, which is so exciting. We're, we get really excited when we talk about this. Our reviews are speeding up because it's taking way too long to get that information to our states and our districts on whether they're green rated to make those decisions. So our review process is going to speed up from what normally takes six months to now 12 weeks. So we're super excited about that change. Yes, there is a way to sign up to be a reviewer um, for for science, math, reading. Social studies is coming up, but if you want to get into the weeds and start reviewing, we love all educators. We train you whether you have that content knowledge or not. It's um, on our website as well. 
we can send that information to you um, if you would like to sign up to become a reviewer. You are compensated for that too. And just in terms of Robin's comment, Robin, I think that goes back to some of the slides that we saw earlier too. It's, it is that, it's that they're creating their own. And, you know, one of the things we have been doing pilot visits lately with our uh, pilot districts. And one of the things we keep hearing from teachers is how now that they have this comprehensive curriculum, this comprehensive resource in place, they are able to now focus instead of just what to teach, like trying to figure out what they're going to use and pulling from different places to how to use what that, uh, HQIR makes available and really leverage that to meet the needs of the students sitting in front of them. So that's one of the things we're hoping will continue to change in the landscape across Kentucky for our teachers as they have more availability to HQIRs in their district is that just that shift from what are we teaching to how are we going to really leverage this resource to meet the needs of our students. And building on that, the coherence piece, if te teachers are working into the wee hours trying to create or cobble together what they're going to do tomorrow, that internal coherence and, and from the student side, how the learning, even within a single classroom, really fits together, let alone that coherence across classrooms and grade levels, um, is just going to be impossible to get at. <clears throat> Absolutely. And Deborah's question about the pre-K materials, we're not sure the grade band, um, I, they're already doing that. I can reach out to you if you want to send me your email. I'll be happy to look into that and let you know exactly what the content um, or grade band or span it is. And the only other thing that I would say, like looking at Casey's comment, I think you're exactly right. And that's why we would say that the work of selecting an instructional resource needs to happen at the district level. Again, going back to that coherence across grade levels, um, because that's why stakeholder inclusion is going to be completely or really important. Because to your point, if teachers are the ones tasked with trying to go through that select that evaluation and selection process, there's just no way. And they may not even all land in the same place. It, it, so that starting with that instructional vision that creates this common thing that we value in the student experience across our district and making sure their stakeholder inclusion in that work, and then using that to inform the selection criteria and really making sure that, I think Fox said it well earlier, that once that district selection is made, it's truly something that everyone can kind of have ownership in and really commit to uh, implementing. Because, you know, we're finding across the state, early implementation comes with a lot of challenges. So the more you have that buy-in on the upfront, the easier it is to navigate the challenges of early implementation, especially especially in the change of rigor that's going to be occurring in classrooms. And timing wise, even with a district curriculum team sort of designated for that purpose within the curriculum development process, we typically allow an academic year just for all of that pre-work and then moving into identifying, evaluating and adopting. So with a dedicated team put to it, it still, it still takes considerable time. And yeah, individual educators, it would, they would just be way overtaxed. <clears throat> Okay. Well, thank you guys for those questions. I'm going to drop our emails in the chat. If you all have any additional questions about reviews, reports, upcoming reviews, or anything that's pre-K or whatever, please email us. We're, we're, we respond pretty quickly. So thank you all. Just that last comment in the chat, again, probably what a lot of us see um, in the elementary space is even when there is something that touches upon science or social studies, let's say, it's often only the subject matter of that content area without any of that disciplinary thinking or engagement oftentimes. So periodically you might get to read something that's social studies or science-like, um, but not really getting that, that full learner experience that the standards would call for. Um, okay, so this next section is a quick overview of how to support districts using the consumer guide. So lessons learned from the reading, writing, and math pilots have really underscored for us um, through those experiences that we've had. Um, and in the science pilot as well, 
uh, some key takeaways. So I'm going to give you a moment as they come up on the slide to read um, the three that we're going to we're going to think about together today. So for some commentary, for the instructional vision, uh, I'd probably add that that having one, and Missy was sort of speaking to this a moment ago, having one that's co-created and then, you know, kind of using social studies language, kind of ratified by stakeholders in the district is essential for having an adopted HQIR really feel like a tool that the district is, is choosing to use to achieve what it identifies as valuable, rather than it potentially feeling like something that's being externally imposed, if that makes sense. Um, which obviously is not great for buy-in. Um, for communication and inclusion, we've seen, and again, this is kind of a similar thread, that really doing the curriculum development process together with clarity and inclusion creates the unity needed to then sort of weather with locked arms, if you will, the challenges of early implementation. Um, and then for CBPL, for curriculum-based professional learning, I'd probably add that its impacts occur across what you can see is sort of three interrelated levels. So first, it acts as an implementation support and helps implementation be effective. Second, it addresses those instructional practice needs that we know exist in our districts in ways that transfer better than traditional professional learning, even when that PL is well done, um, has been able to. Um, and that's really so because the professional learning and curriculum-based professional learning what's focused upon is emerging immediately out of the resource teachers are using every day. And then the professional learning they do feeds directly back into what's upcoming in the resource and what they're going to be doing in their classroom. So that issue of, of transfer is really less less of a problem and, and more of a benefit. Um, and then third, it can act as a response to what research has shown that teachers themselves most want from the professional learning they participate in. And they've said in the research that it, it really, they want professional learning that helps them better use their instructional materials. So again, they're wanting that immediate connection between the PL they're experiencing and, and the immediacy of like what they're doing in their classrooms. Concluding for post-secondary today, um, we're gonna move into a debrief here. Uh, and, and obviously we're gonna stay together, whole group here in the main room. So just take a moment to consider the prompts that you see on the screen um, on the screen right now before we shift into discussion. So I'll give you a chance to read those and pull some thoughts together. And as those thoughts come together, um, there's space on page three of your participant handout to jot some down, because I know there could be maybe a lot to keep up with. OK. Uh, and if you're still thinking and jotting, that's okay. But as you all are ready, we're going to partition this a bit, and we're going to take the first question first, and then we'll bundle the, the second and third. So for that first question, and from your perspective, what ideas from the session seemed most significant? So either posting in the chat or sharing aloud might be good. From your unique perspective, what ideas from the session seemed most significant when we, again, we think about that post-secondary context? Um. I think I really liked and would want to just echo to um, the the response in the chat that yes, there there is a lot of information which we can take back to our classroom and share with our um, pre-service teachers who are in the program and always talking about resources. I still see a common trend where when we talk about resources in science, they're gonna just Google. Um, it's just how it's the 
how the generation is. Um, but it is also our job to make sure that we kind of just always steer them away for that from that. Um, even if it 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 comes to town down to the point where we actually open the website in front of them, have them open it on their um, tool, and then help them navigate. If ha it has to be broken down into that uh, minute piece. I think that's what I, I'm coming to is needs to happen because um, when you tell them and they leave the classroom, they just go back to Google. And that's not how we can make sure they, that, that they have a habit of it. So that's what I am going away with. Um, and yeah, as many of us are also having that in the chat resonate with so many of uh, my colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you're, it, it sounds like you're thinking to really lock this in and, and have it give it a better chance of sticking beyond just sort of making the case for this. You, you might need to explicitly demonstrate and walk them through um, what doing this properly actually is like. Um, because you're seeing that tendency to resort back to just Googling and then going with what's found that way. Yes, yes. It, even if it has to be, um, you know, spoon fed, then, mm -hmm. it, you know, it it may be that. Um, just having them do that and understand, uh, help, helping them understand the difference, even though we um, emphasize enough, um, that you know, websites like Teachers Pay Teachers, not to go against those websites and not to say whatever comes out of that is not um, research, but it is not technically. So just let them know falling back on on a much firmer ground is going to help them bounce better um, versus you know where you are just randomly doing um, things as needed. So yeah. yeah. And I think I would add to that, you know, my background, I, I was a high school biology teacher. And so when I think about like what I had to do to put together something that seemed somewhat coherent, aligned to the standards and just how hard that was. And when I've looked at some of the green rated and some of those are OER, so they're free. And I think you can use those examples with your students to highlight what this could look like, because I can tell you when I looked at some of those, I'm like, Oh my gosh, if I were back in the classroom now and I had this, like, I want to apologize to all the students I've ever had because I could have done such a better job of really just, I think, pushing the ideas of science and making them critical consumers of information because those developers of those programs, they have access to things I just didn't have access to as a teacher to create this beautiful program. And when you see the way they put those together and you hold that up against something that may, that we just know it's not vetted on teacher pay teachers, not to say everything on there is bad quality. It's just not vetted. It's just like, how can we help them see that stark contrast and what that means for the student experience when we're using these high quality resources versus what we're trying to cobble together from unvetted sites. Yes, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. I think, and, and I would defer a little bit to Crystal and Thomas on this, and is Melissa on the call? Melissa, is Melissa Diebels here? Because she could take that question around the praxis. That's one we can get back to you on if she is yep. not here, because Melissa would be able out of the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness better speak to that than we could. So that, that's a great question. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, we, and getting yeah, more, like, I think in the chat, getting more sort of conversant with ed reports um, so that how to navigate it, but also sort of it, it, its deeper uses become something that are easily accessible for you and can be made, you know, more accessible to, to folks you work with. Absolutely. 
And back to that praxis question, I know that because of the work around read to succeed and then also the upcoming numeracy that is the bill that passed, we're seeing better alignment. We're seeing some things around with that. I, I just don't know that we're there in science yet, really looking at that um, alignment piece. I love that wondering about the the cohesiveness of, of the induction process, yeah. um, thinking about understanding and applying HQIRs for pre-service teachers and, and really tabling that as a topic of conversation for individual EPPs. I love that consideration. <clears throat> Okay, so and again, this um, avenue of conversation remains open, either on muting or sharing in the chat. As we come around to those second two, and you can you can take them up independently, or you can let them flow together. So thinking about what might be some potential implications of this learning for the post secondary context, and we've started toward that maybe a little bit, and then what might in integration of some of these ideas be like in preparation programs or in the clinical experience for teacher candidates and for teachers, and we've. We've sort of broached some of that as well, but bringing in those 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 second two, does that bring anything else up top of mind either to post or sh to share aloud and speak to? I just want to piggyback on something that was said earlier um, when we were talking about ed reports and the question was raised about uh, being able to see OER resources, which ones were free. Um, in teaching the the mathematics courses for at, at my university uh, for our pre-service teachers, uh, I I rely pretty heavily on the OER uh, on the OERs that are green on Ed reports, and I actually have my students integrate those into all of their lesson planning that they do for me, and I think that that's a that's a huge thing. And if there's a way that Ed reports can can integrate that in so that it's easier for us to see those resources so that we can share them with our pre-service teachers, I think that would be that would be huge. And I think for us, it's been a, a priority. We've really pushed with all of our pre-service teachers uh, the idea of of you of using those as an anchor point, like Misty was saying, you know, if if, if we had that as, when we were in the classroom and I spent some time in the classroom in middle school, um, if I'd had these resources and had and had these things, I could have designed so much richer uh, opportunities for my students. And I think it's it's just super important that we share with our pre-service teachers um, how you know, how how well they have it. Um, I think they don't realize sometimes that they have these wonderful resources, and it's almost like they're afraid to use them because they're not pretty or they're not colorful you know and and so i'm working with my students that that they can they, they can start with these resources and they can make them pretty and colorful if they if that's something that they feel like they have to have in their classroom then they can do that but they can do it through this lens of high quality resources thank you johnny for sharing all of that that is a perfect spokesperson for exactly what we aim to do with our reports and everything um I think a lot of it too, like the pre-service teachers, maybe they didn't have role models like when they were in school. So like the teachers that was using are using the old traditional textbooks and so they're not using the high quality. So it's frightening to them like what it really means. So love the idea of making it their own, but using those as their their starting point. Excellent. And so can I speak to that for just a moment as well? Absolutely. So we we've had the opportunity to visit lots of schools that are using high quality instructional resources and we have seen tremendous engagement with the knowledge building and the text themselves really baiting the hook for students and really sparking their their uh, inquiry and their fascination about learning in general um, which is a huge shift from the idea of we need to bring some novelty into this and sort of trick students into learning. So it's the learning experience itself that really baits the hook and brings the students in as they're asking questions and as they have opportunities to explore these really deep and rich ideas and concepts. So I think um, we have some of the preconceived notions that high quality instructional resources or textbooks of old that we might have experienced as learners growing up where it's just a very dry delivery, but the resources that make it through the gateways um, and are identified as high quality 
are deemed that way because they really bring to life the experiences we would want to see for students when within each of those disciplines. So students are engaging in very innovative practices of inquiry and exploring phenomena and um, really leaning into discourse in the classroom. Um, so it, it helps to embody those experiences we would want to see for students. On the other side of that is that great need for professional learning for teachers to be able to use those resources as they were designed. And I think that that's really where we are leaning into now is how do we support teachers and being able to effectively um, dive into those resources, um, intellectually prepare for utilizing those resources in the classroom. Very well said, Crystal. Thank you. Crystal, building on that and then going back to the idea of really having teachers in training, working with um, open education resources that are high quality, it, it seems like a lot of what, what we've traditionally wanted teachers to really understand, um, those haven't necessarily changed. Like it, it's just what we're wanting them to then do with those understandings, those pedagogical understandings that has changed. So rather than using them to design and create, it really is more about, as Crystal was saying, that intellectual preparation and having enough understanding of the core dimensions of, of good instruction to really recognize and make sense of those things as they're embedded in a resource and then start to have a sense of how do I leverage them um, in my, you know, in class through my facilitation. Um, so being able to see high quality examples of what these pedagogical sort of context, concepts look like in practice could really help teachers even understand those concepts themselves because having examples of what does this look like actually deployed could be really useful and just teachers even arriving at those understandings we've been after um, anyhow. Any other thoughts before we conclude? <clears throat> Well, the, the chat are open, you know, the chat will remain open. Feel free to stay for a little bit. Is there special education high leverage practices? Oh, in special education, high leverage practices are the latest approach. Ah, so thoughts on that, thoughts on special education, high leverage practices um, as sort of the latest approach in education and how HQIRs relate. You would find some of them, you know, as showing up as as the differentiated supports, you know, in the core tier one and and what resources might provide for for tier two support as well. But any anything that folks would elaborate elaborate on as far as how those special education practices would relate to HQIR. I would say that they're going to be unique per the you know product <clears throat> that you're looking at, but. As a general rule, um, from what I've seen from looking at different examples, is that they're kind of built in as sort of the intelligent design of the resource itself. Um, so um, I'm thinking more through the lens of language development and things like that, which we know some of our special education students need supports around. They'll use uh, Venn diagrams and different um, language graphics to help support their language development. Um, one of the things that I have found significantly um, impactful in regards to special education supports is the comprehensive nature of the resource and the instructional coherence that it provides. So when special education teachers, and we know that core classroom teachers are also responsible for those special education supports um, in the classroom as well, when they are all planning around a common curriculum and they're receiving that professional learning together, it supports the student in that all of their um, supports are aligned to that consistent vocabulary, consistent routines, um, which we know helps to improve outcomes. And I don't know if Ed reports would agree, and so feel free to chime in on this, but I think different HQIRs may do that to different degrees. And so when you get into that, I think uh, Stephanie said earlier, gateway three, criterion three, like that's where you're really going to see the, the list of them. But I will tell you, one of the things that we have found most impactful is requesting samples of HQIRs and just digging in to see what they have available in there. But broadly, one thing we've seen with the HQIRs, it really does 
bring the learning and cognitive sciences together that are kind of those best practices across the board for all students. And so like even in some of the science ones, it's as you're asking these discussion questions, it is giving you supports around sentence stems that you could use with students to help them frame their thinking, like lots of different types of supports built in. Like if they're having this misconceptions, here's how you might address that. So lots of those underlying supports are built in, but I think there is still going to be even in HQIR's green rated, some variation within that. And building on that, thank you for providing some of those um, those high leverage practice examples and, and just the listing offered there, um, especially with use of technology, incorporation of direct and explicit instruction, strategic questions, and then active engagement. There's gonna be some variation across resources, but yes, those are very commonly embedded, oftentimes with some educative support to help teachers leverage them. So yeah, those, those elements of, of, of effective high quality design that would make learning accessible for a wide range of learners are consistently present in the HQIRs across content areas that I've had a chance to work with. And to different degrees, they also embed the social emotional. Like we, we've we seen that in, in different ways, different resources will take that up. Yes. And in what way, to what extent, and how implicitly or explicitly varies. But again, um, that can go different ways. If, if, if the social emotional piece is, is something of interest, would be a great thing to ask about directly with a with a vendor. <clears throat> okay, so before we we con we conclude today we would ask that you complete um, an exit ticket and the Google form just appeared in the chat. So I'll give you a moment to access that. Um, and then once you once you have, um, you are free to go and we would just go ahead while we're all together and thank you now uh, so much for being with us today, for the willingness to share your thinking and your insights and perspective. Um, we really just so appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you yes. have, any like follow-up support you, you may uh, recognize as needed. Again, please feel free to reach out. Yes, thank you all for being with us today. Um, reach out if you have any questions or if we can support you in any way.